As we look at movement number four, the conquest, we first, we want to talk about the book of Joshua, how it functions. We are now moving out of the Torah, and in the Hebrew Bible, this begins a section of Scripture that are called the prophets. In this very first book, in this very first next section out of the Torah, we have this book called Joshua. It has a few purposes for us. I want you to notice and underline, when we talk about the historical purpose and the doctrinal purpose, I want you to underline the word promise. Historical purpose. It shows us that God is a faithful promise keeper and promise, He's a promise maker and a promise keeper. He makes covenants and promises and He is true to His Word. Doctrinally, we can trust Him. We can buy into Him. We know that when God makes a promise, He keeps it. And that's helpful for us because when we see promises like those maybe in Romans 8, for example, it's helpful to see that the story that the Bible is telling us is that God is a faithful promise keeper. He's a faithful promise maker, and we can take it to the bank. And so with that in mind, we also see this very interesting, we call it the Christological purpose, this is number three on page uh, 63. We're going to see this random figure show up that's called the commander of the Lord's army. And we're going to see other figures in the biblical narrative, the figure called the angel of the Lord. And it's a figure that the characters seem to, to, seem to revere. They, some, they seem to fall down and worship. And what we see is this is a complex unity. It's a complex portrait of Yahweh in our Old Testament. And what that begins to foreshadow for us is a picture, possibly, of what the New Testament authors will reflect on and then turn with words like our Trinity. And so many see the commander of the Lord's army in Joshua 5 as a pre-Christmas encounter with Jesus. And uh, it's just really cool to think about. If you turn the page to page 64, we get to dive into <clears throat> these theological themes, then we'll look at the actual notches themselves. First, God's faithfulness. Notice, He had promised to give the people of Israel land, descendants, and to bless them, and through them to bless the nations. And look how many times God keeps re-amplifying that promise. Joshua 6, see, I've given Jericho to you. Joshua 8, I've given them into your hands. Joshua 10, do not fear, I've given them into your hands. This is yours. I have promised it. Go take it. It's, I'm making this happen by my divine will. And yet, what we're going to see paired is number two. Uh, listen here on page 64. God is faithful to His promise, and He says, I've given this into your hand. And yet, look at what it says in Joshua 1, verse 7 and 8. Be strong and courageous. Be careful to do everything that the law of Moses, my servant, commanded you. Don't turn from the right or to the left. Don't let this book of the law depart from your mouth. And He will tell them over and over again, this is yours, now go take it. This is yours. Now go obey me. This is yours. Now go. And what we're highlighting as we look at this is it's looked here on page 65, number four. The biblical tension between divine enablement and human effort. Divine enablement and human effort. That God has determined something to be so, and yet He asks and He invites humans to participate in the 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 achieving of that thing. And it's a tension that we're going to see repeat over and over again in Scripture. Now, what we want to do is we want to pull all this out and go into philosophy lab and ask the question, did God choose us or did we choose God? How do we answer that? Or do we have human freedom if God has divine sovereignty? How does that all work? And what the Bible is going to do is it's not going to neatly drop out of the narrative and be placed into the philosophy lab. And so what we have to do is we're going to have to let the narrative stand and speak for itself. And then it's going to create for us a little bit of tension. I want you to notice the insight we, that we have here in the box. Here's the insight. It says, The book of Joshua illustrates the compatible truths of both divine enablement coupled with human effort. What God commands, He provides through His provision of whatever is needed. But God will not divinely enable apart from man's human effort. God will always do His part. Man must always do His part. Thus, trust and obey. 
And I think this is just such an interesting picture of Yahweh in our Old Testament. Yahweh desires to bless the world. That's His goal. He's promised it. He's guaranteed it. And yet, He wants to do so through human agents. He doesn't have to do so through human agents, but that seems to be the primary way that God wants to bring this blessing to the world is through humans. And as we develop that story, we're going to see that come to full fruition in Jesus and His church. And that's what we're called to be and do now. But we've got to build to get there. Now turn to page, page 66. Now let's look at the actual notches as we build this through. Joshua <clears throat> is called to be the new leader of Israel. And I want you to notice, look, how, look at the repetition of what Moses tells him and then what Yahweh will tell him. He continues to say over and over again, look at uh, uh, Deuteronomy 31, Moses summoned Joshua and said, be strong and courageous. Look at the end of that section. He'll be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. So don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. Then Yahweh spoke said, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened. The people then tell Joshua, hey Joshua, be strong and courageous. Do, the insight that I have in just looking at this, that makes me wonder, maybe Joshua is weak and terrified and he needs constant affirmation that Yahweh is with you, we are with you, God is with you, you can do this. And if you are like me, to me that's encouraging. Oftentimes we think that a leader has to be, uh, have all the answers, have no doubt, have no fear, have everything buttoned up, and it can be helpful for some, certain leaders to have some of those skills of confidence and being uh, assertive. But oftentimes God will use leaders who show lots of frailty, lots of fear, and yet God still uses them. And I think that is such a interesting pastoral note for you and for me. And if you're discipling people, we need to help them understand that our strength, our courage does not come from some sort of internal mustering up of the strength or some internal psychological game that we play with ourselves. In other words, our strength or our courage does not come from our feelings of courage. It comes from the object of our trust. We might say it this way. Weak faith in a strong branch is way better than strong faith in a weak branch. And so often, this is what Jesus is after, the object of our trust is in the accomplished power and work of Yahweh through His Son, Jesus. And frequently we place, we assess the strength of our faith or the strength of our relationship with God at any given moment, essentially in how we internally feel and how we feel at any given moment. And that can lead us astray so often. Instead, the strength of our confidence, the strength of our courage, the strength of our assurance is always in the object of our faith. So I say again, weak, feeble, doubting faith in a strong branch to hold you is way better than really strong faith in a weak branch. And oftentimes the weak branch that we're putting our faith in is really just how we feel at any given moment. We leave a worship service, we felt really alive. We leave a conference, we feel really good. And a lot of the time we don't feel it. A lot of times we feel doubt or anxiety. And we tether our courage to our feelings. And that's such a, such a dangerous place to do that. Now the necessary focus that Joshua is gonna need, we get on page 67. Remember the word that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, Yahweh your God, He is the one who is going to provide everything that you need. Yahweh is doing everything for you, so trust and obey Him. With, in light of that, there's naturally going to be a little bit of an issue. Here's the issue. As they make their way into the land, there's going to be people in that land. And they're going to be asked by Yahweh to drive them out, to clear them out. And we have it, we have it written for us here. Notice what 
Moses had said in Deuteronomy chapter 7, When the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it, and notice, when Yahweh clears away, this is the word that has, it, it has to do with loosening, uh, like loosening or untying something, or slowly taking something and loosening it away. That's what this idea is. The, it lists some of the peoples there, and you can read there. When the Lord your God delivers them before you and you defeat them, then you shall take them away, utterly destroy them. Just a few verses later than this, in Deuteronomy 7, 22, God, God will say this. He says, Yahweh will not clear away these nations. He's going to do this little by little. It's not going to be all at once. It's going to happen little by little, lest the wild beasts grow too numerous for you. In other words, go in, go confidently in, and I will drive them away little by little. And when you then go in, they're going to leave behind a whole bunch of false gods and idols, destroy all of them. Otherwise, they will... They will be for you thorns and thistles. So look down to the middle, uh, page verse 5 of this long section in Deuteronomy 7. Here's what you should do to them. Tear down their altars, smash their pillars, hew down their asherim, burn their graven images. You are to be holy. You are a chosen people. You have to go in there and wipe out all of their forms of worship because otherwise you will be tempted to compromise with their gods. You will fall victim to those gods. You'll give your allegiance and your loyalty to those gods. And this is the mandate for Joshua. Lead the people in. I'll drive them out little by little. Go and take the land. I'm inviting you in. And now we're going to pick up the story with Rahab.